Welcome to Citrus Conversations. This is a new series we're doing as part of UFIFA's Extension Outreach, uh, bringing information to growers in a timely manner on things that are uh, relevant to what you can do in your grows right now uh, in terms of HLB and other issues that we're facing in the industry. And now we've, we've just gone through a hurricane, hurricane in. There's a lot of things that you should be thinking about in your groves as you try to rehabilitate trees, uh, recover from the storm damage, and prepare for future uh, uh, crops to come both this year and next year. And so we've got several faculty we'll be talking to today, uh, talking about some of the research topics they've been working on, how it relates to hurricane recovery, and what you should be doing now in your groves. So our first faculty member we'll be talking to is uh, Dr. Christopher Vincent. Uh, he's a, a citrus physiologist here at the Citrus Research and Education Center in Lake Alfred. Uh, Dr. Vincent, can you tell us a little bit about some of the immediate impacts of the hurricane on the tree's health and uh, what, what growers should be thinking about in the weeks ahead as far as recovery? Yes, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think growers are pretty familiar with, with how hurricanes can affect uh, tree health. Uh, the most extreme effect is if the grove was, was flooded for any length of time. Obviously, that's going to impact uh, the root system, its ability to take up water and nutrients. Uh, and then in terms of like wind speed impacts, there's direct damage to the leaves. And then there's the strain on the limbs of, of the twisting from the wind. Uh, and what that does is it inhibits the ability of that branch to move water and nutrients from the trunk or the roots up to the leaves. So you have, if the, if the grove experienced both flooding and uh, wind strain, then you have two places where the tree is, uh, where, where it's been made much more difficult for the tree to take up uh, what it needs. Uh, so, so the horticultural practices need to take that into account, how, how it, the tree is really limited in how quickly it can take up water and, and fertilizer as well. Yeah, and so it sounds like that uh, water stress can be an issue going forward for these trees, which is almost counterintuitive. Sometimes you think about, okay, these trees have been flooded, they've had plenty of water, but that's not the case. So we, right. so what do growers need to think about in terms of their irrigation practices going forward? Yeah, so I think most, I think most growers have, have already been prioritizing this, but they need to get their irrigation systems up and running as quickly as possible, uh, and then irrigate as frequently as their system allows. Uh, I mean, and when I say as frequently as it allows, if they can do twice a day, twice a day, not more water than, than they would otherwise irrigate with. They don't need more, they just need it more frequently. Uh, because what happens is, is if they irrigate with a lot, uh, less frequently the, the water drains out of the soil profile and, and the trees don't get the opportunity to take it up. Uh, but if they can irrigate with the same total amount, but more frequently, that gives the trees more opportunity to, to take up those little amounts at a time. Okay. And um, I know everybody's going to have different limitations on how often they can irrigate. So say you can't do twice a day every day or can you every other day i mean how do you how do you schedule right. that and how do you know when you need to irrigate what do they need to be looking at as a metric or a, a indicator that okay i do need to water my trees is there soil moisture or how do you how do you assess that yeah so i mean i would set soil moisture targets um the best thing is if you have a tensiometer but most most folks don't most most folks have uh, volumetric uh sensors that will give them like a percentage of the water holding capacity of the soil or of, or of the pore space uh, how much their soil needs actually depends a lot on the specific soil characteristics. So there's not like a number that I could say, uh, you know, no. 20% or something like that. Uh, if they have tensiometers, then they should target, you know, below, uh, 25 centibars. Uh, yeah, below 25 mm -hmm. centibars, uh, should be, they should be irrigating before they get past that. Okay. That number. All right. So obviously, yeah, irrigation is something we may not be thinking about too much, but it is important. And one of the things you mentioned, you know, getting the irrigation systems ready to go. Uh, I was talking to our one of our entomologists, uh, Dr. Lauren Diepenbrock, yesterday, and she mentioned that we're seeing an outbreak of, of snails starting the next generation of snails coming on. And a lot of growers have had issues with snails clogging the emitters. And what will happen right now is so you may want to pay attention to this. I'm just mentioning it in passing is that they'll be laying their eggs and the, and the really small snails are starting to develop in those emitters right now. And you may not see that. You may not see them with a the naked eye, but you can take a paper clip and clean out those emitters and make sure that all your lines are working because we are seeing those snails. The problems are starting to build up and they'll become even more pronounced over time. So just another little hassle to think about is as you're working on getting your irrigation system set back up. Yeah. 
But, um, but as far as water use efficiency, there's also some work you've done looking at things, ways you can actually alleviate water stress on trees using uh, kaolin particle films. Right. So what we've seen is that is that particle films can help the plants maintain a, a better leaf water status, even when soil water is limiting, or in this case, when water supply even from from the soil to the to the leaf is limiting. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend using a bunch of kale and clay on trees that have really been completely defoliated. If, so if you had really extreme wind damage and complete defoliation, I don't think that you need to spray mm -hmm. leafless trees. Uh, but for trees that retain the majority of their foliage, this would be a really great way to uh, kind of keep that foliage as healthy as can be and uh, and help them grow uh, moving forward as the conditions improve. Okay. And, and the work you've been doing with, with kale and clay recently, what are the rates per acre or, or pounds per acre or, or per spray volume that you're, you're recommending? So kind of like the water, we, we tend to recommend uh, less, lower rates uh, more frequently is what we're observing is having a, a more positive impact, although we don't have really strong data on that yet. Um, however, in this case, I would say a high rate would be a good place to start because these trees are undergoing lots of stresses of different kinds. Uh, and, and so to really sort of like cool that down and help and help them recover, I would recommend a higher rate. So that would be in the range of 50 pounds per acre if you're uh, equivalent of surround. So if you're mm -hmm. using the surround product, let's say 50 pounds per acre. Uh, if you're not adding uh, a colorant, if you are adding a colorant, drop that down to 35 pounds per acre. And spray volumes, when you say per acre, I'm always thinking in volumes, is that 50 pounds per 100 gallons or 150 gallons of water? What, what's the spray volume you're, you're normally using? So usually we use 100 per acre, 100 okay. gallons per acre. All right. Okay, very good. And and do you do you have a preference between the red and white kaolin? I mean, you, we've talked about in the past, uh, you know, you've worked out a recipe for dyeing that kaolin red and there's benefits in terms of, I guess, well, I'll let you explain the benefits of the red kaolin. Yeah, so so under most conditions, we do see benefits from using the the red versus the white. Um, it's more effective, the red colorant is more effective in preventing psyllids from landing, which, which may be important as new flush emerges. Uh, and a lot of folks think you actually have to keep that flush covered. Uh, it's not really based on how much of the flush is covered. If the, if the psyllid already arrived at the tree, it can smell the flush and get to it. Uh, but what it prevents is, is prevents the psyllid from flying in that direction. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the red does a little bit better of a job than that, uh, than the white on, on that account. And both of them help um, in terms of growth. Uh, the red tends to tends to improve growth in general better okay. than the white does, uh, but uh, we haven't worked out all the details of that. So there may be conditions under which that's not okay. necessarily true. Yeah, and and with the um, applying kaolin, right now we've especially where areas they've had a lot of leaf loss. We're going to start to see more leaf growth as we get into the fall, and we'll talk with uh, Dr. Vashish in a little bit about how, ways to promote uh, leaf growth. But there are certain stages you don't want to apply kaolin because the younger leaves they're kind of they kind of repel the waxy layer will repel the kaolin. So, at what what point do you recommend in, in leaf growth? Do you recommend the kaolin go out? Yeah. So, uh, so you want to apply to as mature leaves as you can. Um, so if you have a if you're if you have old leaves that you want to cover, that's good. But don't expect the kaolin to cover expanding leaves. So after they're fully expanded, then then you can get good uh, sticking, mm -hmm. <laughs> good adhesion to the to the leaf. Uh, but but before expansion, uh, they're, they're going to wash out. The kaolin is going to wash out faster, and also just because they're expanding so rapidly, it will get diluted on the surface, so it won't make that much of a difference. Okay, well, that's all good advice, and I know that as as the months go on, we'll see some big flushes this fall and. And that the kaolin application, I think it sort of serves that dual purpose for growers because we will see those psyllid populations increase later on in the fall on that new flush. So, it's a good good thing to be watching for. Um, there's a lot uh, going on right now. A lot of people looking at the effects of the hurricane on groves. We see a, a quite a range of, of damage around the state, um, and we're look we're wanting to understand you know how these groves are going to recover. What growers have been doing that that's working well in either of the the groves weathering the storm or how they're going to respond in the future with with increased production. 
you have a, a special grant or a project you're working on, uh, kind of a hurricane recovery project. Can you explain a little bit more about that project and, and how growers can help out with that? Right. So uh, what we intend to do is is uh, basically do kind of like a survey of trees throughout the, the area that was affected by the hurricane and even outside of it so that we have an, kind of a baseline for, for what trees that weren't so stressed uh, are doing. And, uh, and so we want groves from all the way from the most dramatically impacted to, uh, to, oh, nothing happened in my grove, that whole range, we need, we need everything in between in order to understand uh, the severity of impacts and then also how long it takes to recover depending on that severity. Um, what we need growers uh, help in is, is supplying us with those groves. Uh, okay. So, uh, and permission to go in. <laughs> we <laughs> yes. could probably find them, but we need permission. Yes. Uh, and so, so a student of mine will be making the rounds uh, throughout the state, uh, taking a, a few measurements on trees. Uh, it won't cost anything uh, to the grower other than a couple of minutes to answer, you know, maybe like three minutes to answer a few questions about the history of the grove. Uh, we need permission <laughs> to mm -hmm. get in, locations, uh, and and some a little bit of information about the history of the grove and what the growers have been doing and uh what they get out of it is that as they participate we'll be sending them updates about what we're seeing in the grove so uh we'll we'll be sending them summaries of okay here's how we think that recovery process is faring um and and so they'll get a little bit more information about what's going on statewide and and uh and then uh, we can even provide them with what's going on in their specific grove if they need it Okay. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, so we need, we need their help. We need their contact information. We need their grove locations if they're willing to participate and, and hopefully it will give them a little bit of information about what we, what we see is working or not working in terms of enhancing recovery. Okay. And we'll be putting out information, um, through our newsletter and other communication means, uh, for growers to get in contact with you. But, uh, Right now, I mean, maybe you want to give your email address for folks to could reach out to you by email. Yeah, yeah. So my email address is c i v i n c e at ufl dot edu, and uh, yeah. So email is a great way to get in touch. Um, very responsive. Okay. All right, and we, and we hope that uh, growers will help uh, this program and participate. Uh, you know, by just offering up their grove for us to have a look at. And again, we'll be providing that feedback on what we're seeing and hopefully we'll get some good information on, on how grows spared, what those practices were that, that made a difference in keeping those trees productive throughout the storm. And uh, uh, it'll benefit everybody in the industry. So, so good luck with the project and Thanks. thank you for your time this morning. Appreciate it. All right, now we're joined by uh, Dr. Megan Dooney, one of our plant pathologists here in IFAS, uh, to talk about some of the disease issues in citrus uh, post Hurricane Inn. We've already talked about um, flooding issues and plant stress issues. Uh, we had to be negative, but there are things we have to talk about to be looking for, growers should be looking for in their groves related to disease issues. So, so uh, Dr. Dooney, what, what are the things that growers need to be looking for right now, disease wise, in the groves? Well, probably the most uh, urgent at the moment would be looking at any groves that have had a history of Phytophthora. Um, and that means that you've got a uh, propagule count that's somewhere between 10 and 20 propagules per cubic centimeter of soil that's sampled. Um, and if you're already in that range, you should be thinking about Phytophthora root rot in general, and hopefully you're already on a program. Uh, but it, either way, uh, you should be considering trying to get out a uh, treatment in the next 30 days as the as the drying and the flooding subsides uh, and you can get in there. Um, talking about irrigation, uh, one of the ways that we would prefer to see a lot of treatments go out is through the irrigation systems. Uh, this does mean that uh, instead of doing at least four when you're doing the treatment, you're going to need to follow up with a fair amount of water. Those are very specified amounts in the labels as you read them carefully uh, because things like Ritamil, uh, Arondas tend to be a little less uh, soluble than, uh, than say a phosphite or Aliette. Uh, so hopefully if you've already had a history of Phytophthora, you're on a program, you should continue that program moving into your next rotation. Rotation with Phytophthora is important. We're starting to see slowly but surely reports of less efficacy, I wouldn't call it resistance, but lower efficacy of some of our products. 
Uh, so it's very helpful to have a program where you are rotating amongst your phosphites, uh, Ritamil, the Arondis Presidio, all of those. Um, these will also help. So well, the other problem with phytophthora is it's not only nibbling away at our root systems, which are in general struggling because of HLB. Uh, I think that's been well demonstrated. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to baby those roots as much as we can in, in every way. Um, but also if you've had trees that have been toppled or pushed over and you're thinking of bringing them back up and sort of helping them uh, into the next season, um, just to keep in mind that you're going to, if you've had phytophthora in the grove, you're probably going to have splash up onto the count, onto the trunks, up onto those scions. And regardless of your rootstock, those scions are generally much more susceptible to phytophthora. Okay. Um, and so you may see a lot of foot rot. We did see a lot of foot rot coming in after Irma. Uh, so, but all of the products that you would use for root rot would be a double effect of, of benefit of helping with, with um, foot rot, um, you know, getting up, it, having it get up into the canopies and, and really attacking the main scion. So, so the sole application of these products will help with the foot rot and the things that are higher in the tree as well. They Correct. move systemically in the plant. Yeah, they move systemically within the plant. Um, in general, we don't recommend a lot of foliar applications for, for phytophthora diseases. Um, now, if anybody has enough fruit left on their trees in the earlies, the other consideration is if you have a phytophthora problem, because all the phytophthora diseases are related. There's one, there's two sets of organisms that are responsible, um, but it all starts in the soil. And so, uh, we're going to see a lot of fruit drop right now. Those could become colonized by either Phytophthora nicotiani or Palmivora. Those can then be bounced up into the canopy, and we're probably already seeing some brown. Well, I was getting reports of brown rot prior to, um, but the, with the heavy rains we've had this fall prior to to Ian, um, and so if you've got enough crop to make it even economically viable, which you may not mm -hmm. in the earlies. You should keep an eye on that, and if you if you are seeing brown rot, get out there as quickly as you can and put on. Uh, it's too late for something like a phosphite unless you put it on in August, uh, because that takes time to build up the the immune response in the trees. Uh, but it is um, it would be time that you would put out something like a copper application uh, or one of the Arondas products, either Arondas or Arondas Ultra or Revis, all of which are labeled for one day pre PHI for, for uh, brown rot. And that would be to stop the infection of fruit on the tree. You're going to have some that are already infected, but to stop any further ones getting infected. So these, these foliar applications, these are uh, applied to protect the fruit uh, from phytophthora infection, fruit that's on the trees. How long is that protection going to last? Uh, probably up until about harvest, it should last. Okay. Yeah. So one application generally will get them through harvest. And again, yeah. you said a one day PHI. So that's, that's a benefit there. You don't have to worry too much if you don't know when your pickers are coming in. Yes. Uh, you just want to protect that fruit. And so copper would have a couple more days of PHI. So you need to check your label. All the copper labels okay. are a little bit different, but, um, but Arondas Rebus and Arondas Ultra all have a one day PHI. Okay. That's good to know. So what other diseases do we need to be thinking about? I can I can think of canker being one of those diseases. I, I was here uh, in 2004 when, you know, we thought canker was behind us. It was in a small part of the southeastern part of the state in the urban environment. Uh, thanks to the eradication program, not quite completely eradicated in those areas. And then the hurricane spread it all over. So um, I had never seen canker in, in a Florida citrus grove until after the hurricanes of 04. So Obviously, it's widespread now, um, and maybe also some comments on black spot as well. Okay, well, so canker, of course, the history of canker is intertwined with hurricanes, and uh, there's no getting away from that. So we all know that, that canker spreads with hurricanes. The wind, the rain, together, it forces the bacterium into the fruit or the leaves and the stems uh, by just sheer force, and then the bacterium is in a, in a protected place and it's able to, to grow. Um, and then cause symptoms. Uh, what I'm thinking about in terms of canker, so most of our fruit at a, at a 
physiological stage where it's no longer susceptible to canker, except for grapefruit. And I think a lot of our grapefruit groves fortunately didn't get hit too badly. Mm -hmm. And they're probably on top of a program as much as they can be anyway, um, particularly if they're growing fresh. However, what concerns me most about canker, well, we're gonna see some leaves, we're gonna get defoliation. I don't think we can really spray our way out of that problem. I think it's something that we'll just have to live with. The thing that really concerns me is the upcoming season, it's particularly on young trees, uh, where we're, we have got now stem lesions probably forming, and therefore that's going to be inoculum for the upcoming next four years at minimum. So we're really starting off badly uh, with a canker problem in younger trees that have been affected. Uh, so what I would recommend is that everybody evaluate the use of uh, something like blockade where we stimulate the plant immune system prior to um, our, our season coming out and get on a blockade program for those younger blocks. I think the older blocks, they will manage, mm -hmm. but those younger blocks where we're gonna be getting infections in our scaffold limbs, we wanna put out a blockade application um, and and follow a program at least for the first year after this hurricane to try and keep as much of that inoculum down for future seasons. So really you're trying to set yourself up now for years four, five, and six, where you could get a lot of inoculum coming out of the stems, then they're gonna get in, that's gonna get into your fruit. And then if it ends up early in the season, uh, the fruit's going to end up on the ground. So with all that inoculum out in these groves right now, if people are planning on replanting new blocks, should they also be thinking about these young trees that are coming out of the nurseries that are clean, but should they put them on like a blockade program or something as well? Uh, I would recommend it if you've got a lot of blocks around you that you know are riddled with canker and have, you know, minimal canker management, you know, for whatever mm -hmm. reason, um, I would certainly consider it to protect that investment in the upcoming years. Okay. And then obviously things like leaf miner management that will help facilitate yeah. <laughs> the you spread know, we, of canker. We've used blockade in one of the projects that I've been working on managing young trees and we were able to actually, it got away from us. We weren't expecting it. Uh, and then all of this, so we, we implemented a blockade program and, and ever since we've got that taken care of, it really knocked it down to a dull war. Okay. Good. And, and black spot, that's another another uh, foliar fungal issue that we're dealing with in certain parts of the state. Yep. So Hurricane Irma went through a lot of the major black, pots, black spot areas uh, when it churned its way up through um, southwest Florida. There's some debate as to whether the, all of the further fi finds that they had in some like glades in Charlotte County followed the track of the hurricane or not, I think there's some evidence for, there's some evidence against. So it's sort of a little bit up in the air, it's sort of hard to mm -hmm. forensically track some of that. Because um, there's so, so many different factors that could be involved, including equipment movement among groves. Um, but we did see an uptick in the first three years after Irma of fines. Um, we know that Ian came through another area that did have area, you know, at least some infections with black spot. So I think we're in a wait and see moment to see if we see movement across into DeSoto and Hardy counties, uh, which I hope we don't. Mm -hmm. um, but the most northerly finds were of only about 10 miles south of uh, DeSoto. Uh, and so I know that FDAX and CHIRP have been routinely uh, surveying those areas just in general concern. Um, and hopefully they don't find anything in the next few years, but we're going to have to be in a little bit of a wait and see. And I think everybody should be in those areas, should be thinking about it. Okay. So really right now we're thinking about it, but if, if growers haven't found black spot in their groves, they, they don't need to do anything other than monitor at this time? I don't think so, no. Okay. Um, one thing, one disease that I think we might see a bit more of that we've had sort of chronic issues with are the diplodia stem end rots. We've seen a lot more stem end rot in the last few years. It looks like it's probably associated with the fact that the fruit are a little less well attached to the trees. Uh, and Diplodia is always in the groves, or Laza Diplodia, the, the various fungi that are involved. And uh, with them, with fruit being loosened this year by the hurricane, I suspect that we might see a lot more Laza Diplodia, the stem end rot on the trees that we never used to see, you know, prior to HLB. 
Um, this okay. was never, you know, it was, it was a post-harvest issue and now we're seeing in the trees. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's not good news, but uh, is there yeah. any, are any other any other diseases of concern growers should be looking for right now um, as it relates to the hurricane? I don't think, I think those are the major well, ones. Well, good. We don't want to hear any more then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, nobody nobody loves a, pheto- a, pa- a pathologist. <laughs> yeah, or an homologist sometimes, but yes. Okay, well, thank you for your information today. And, and if you have more questions about some of the disease issues, uh, we encourage you to reach out to Dr. Dudney. Uh, by phone or email or at meetings around the state, which you'll see her throughout this fall. So thank you, Dr. Dudney. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So now we're joined by Dr. Tripti Vashisht, our citrus extension horticulturalist here at the CREC in Lake Alfred. Uh, Tripti, we've seen a lot of a lot of uh, range of damage around the state uh, in terms of impacts of in on trees. Obviously, most all of our trees are going to be under stress. Um, and there's a lot of things that we need to be thinking about in terms of how we re- rehabilitate the trees, some of the horticultural practices. And I want to first turn to uh, fertilization programs. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, these groves, some of, in some parts of the state, the groves have received a lot of rainfall. They're flooded. And so well, how does that affect the fertilization programs? And what should growers be thinking about on fertilizers going forward this year? So definitely uh, fertilizer should be one thing in mind uh, for the growers at this point because with all the rainfall that we have got, the residual fertilizer, if they had made their fall applications already, everything probably has leached out from their ground. So it's like literally starting from zero. Um, So they have to consider fertilization. Also, we know that uh, the trees, if they have lost a lot of canopy, and there is moisture in the ground and the weather is warm, the trees are going to try to flush. So we have to give them some fertilizer. However, the rate of fertilization is really dependent on canopy. If you have lost a significant amount of canopy, uh, you really need to cut down on your fertilizer. So think about how much canopy you have and then apply the fertilizer rather than what you were doing pre-hurricane. This is very similar to a pruning situation. So we know whenever we do a significant amount of pruning, we should always cut down on fertilizer. That's a general practice. So think in that regards. And when you say cut down on fertilizer, are we talking about just NPK or are we also also talking about the micronutrients as well? So anytime, I mean, um, majority of it is because of NPK. Those are major nutrients, a bulk amount of nutrients, but also micronutrients. If your tree doesn't have enough leaves to store that many nutrients, probably you will not be able to take the best uh, use or effective uptake of those nutrients. They will stay in the ground and they will leach out eventually before the next growth spur occurs. Mm-hmm. And we've talked a lot in the past about basing your fertilization practices on, on monitoring your, your taking leaf samples, monitoring the nutrients in the trees. Mm-hmm. If a grower wanted to assess his trees, should they wait until the next big leaf flush and that it harden off? Or, I mean, these trees are stressed. Yes. <laughs> what, what's the, if they, you know, they can't, there's a lot of problem, a lot of constraints, economic constraints. It, you know, it's all hitting at one time. We're trying to save money. So best bang for your buck and spending that money on sampling. When would that be? Um, so I think there's in there's no point of sampling right now. Okay. Um, I think it is best that our growers get the fertilizer that they think is the best guess for their grow for now. We are really not trying to address a particular deficiency at this time. Rather, we are just giving all the resources to the tree to grow. Uh, if they were to take do the sampling, our usual IFAS guidelines are late four to six month old flush, uh, mature leaf flush. So they may be able to get a summer sampling done, but there's no point of doing it now. Just get your regular fertilizer out. Um, Also, another reason why I don't want them to sample right now is they have also lost the fruit. Mm -hmm. And over the years, what we are learning is that the nutrient profile of a leaf from a fruiting branch versus a leaf of a non-fruiting branch is different. So what I'm trying to say is you may have a branch that had a fruit. So your nutrient profile on that leaf might be very different from what you would have expected. So you may mess up your fertilizer program even okay. more. So just get some fertilizer out that you think is the best mm-hmm. guess. Don't spend your money on the leaf nutrient analysis at this point. Okay. And so maybe are we talking springtime for that? 
Yes, okay. spring. Uh, IFS recommendations we are working with the nutrition box. We have been looking into four time sampling, but our old recommendation is still the summer sampling. Mm -hmm. But anyways, we all know that with HLB trees, the more sampling that you can do to assess the nutritional condition is best, especially now the trees have gone through a really bad hurricanes. So it's really good that we try to address the requirements of the tree. Okay. Well, very good and yeah so that's that's going to be a big issue or something to be thinking about uh and just one more added cost that we hate to think about but it is important as you try to rehabilitate those trees mm -hmm. to make sure they're they're getting fed we talked yes. earlier about the watering and but the fertilizer is also an issue as well exactly and in spring trees will be trying to set the fruit we don't we cannot afford to have any deficiencies at that time because okay. that will affect the fruit set. Okay. Now, one of the other things I want to talk about, uh, we, we've talked previously about uh, the use of plant hormones like gibberellic acid. And, and I think that we've ha seen a lot of growers using and using gibberellic acid around the state. Um, you know, we're still learning a lot of what we can do with gibberellic acid, but I think this, this storm really complicates this whole process now because everything we've talked about in the past kind of gets changed a little bit now that we're dealing with trees that have lost a lot of canopy, that are extremely stressed. Um, so I guess just starting off, what are, what are your thoughts on what growers should be doing with gibberellic acid right now? Yes, yeah, so um, I have been a proponent of gibberellic acid. I think gibberellic acid can help the trees, but it really depends on your situation. So if you have lost moderate amount of canopy or lesser than that probably just go ahead and get your gibberellic acid application as we had you would have planned anyways gibberellic acid is going to promote vegetative growth especially when the canopy is lost the tree will try to push new growth so if you provide that gibberellic acid it's going to just be an extra boost for the tree however if you have lost a significant amount of canopy and by significant i mean 70 75 percent or more then that complicates the situation because even though I've been saying the tree will try to um, from push more growth, the problem with the gibberellic acid application on the trees that have lost a significant canopy is that there's not enough canopy to intercept the mm -hmm. chemical. And you may spray it, but if there's no canopy to intercept it, then that's a problem. So in such cases, it would be best that you give tree some time and okay. then spray. Uh, Another situation that I have seen in some of the groves are that um, they have lost the canopy on the side of the tree that was facing the wind. So half, one half of the tree has lost, yes. the other half is still good. Uh, if there is a way that you can get your sprays done on the other side, it really depends if you have ditches or furrows or what you have. So it really is a very much situation dependent. Mm -hmm. But if you have a good canopy, even on the one side of the tree, Get and I think that's the point you're trying to make is that, you know, everybody's situation is different. We all suffered different damage, different parts of the state, um, even even things like one side of the tree being defoliated, another one not. So just having an understanding of how these products work and using that knowledge to design your own program is going to be really important. And what I'm hearing, you know, if you're down in some of the far south counties that really, really took a hit, lost a lot of leaves. Well, right now you shouldn't be thinking about gibberellic acid. And am I correct to say you might be thinking more now about fertilization first to push a leaf flush and then get the gibberellic acid on? Yes, and even with the fertilization, a light dose. A light dose of fertilizer, right. So don't over apply the fertilizer. No. So yeah, it, it ch this changes the way we do everything right now. And so it, it, it's going to require some, some thought um, and, and effort, but a uh, uh, lot of things to think about. Um, so what else? Uh, I guess I've also heard some questions about gibberellic acid in terms of um, application methods, because a lot of growers right now, uh, they, they're still trying to pull out down trees and get their tractors in the grove. And the questions have come up. Can you chemigate, run the, the, the gibberellic acid through the irrigation line and it still be effective? Have you had experience with that? So um, we have not done large scale field trials. In fact, our first trial, we applied product only last week. So okay. <laughs> I don't have a large scale field trial. However, last year we did do some greenhouse studies and what we found is that roots are capable of taking up gibberellic acid. So that's a good news. The roots okay. can take up gibberellic acid. 
However, there are still a lot of questions that needs to be answered, like how much movement of gibberellic acid from roots to the shoot would happen. Mm -hmm. Is gibberellic acid going to just help the root and not go to the shoot? Or will it, what rate we need? Because that's a different thing. We, we have a pretty good uh, understanding of what the foliar spray should be. So there are some unknowns, but still the good news is that roots can take up gibberellic mm -hmm. acid. So I think uh, with what I know, um, economics is the main deciding factor for everybody here. But if the product cost is not a major issue for you, I think getting it out might be better mm -hmm. uh, than not doing anything with these trees because they need help. Yeah, and and you told me earlier a little bit of work that you've been doing, and these are greenhouse studies where you've applied gibberellic acid to the soil and you don't see as long of a residual, I guess, on the in the leaf tissue, but you see the residual in the roots. Yeah. So maybe it's it's a it's helping promote root growth more than it's helping with the leaf canopy in, in that kind of a situation. Yes, exactly. So we see when we apply it on root, we see it in the root for longer time. When we apply it on the leaves, we see it longer in the leaf. Now, one thing uh, that growers may want to do is if you can get a chemigation done now and in four weeks or six weeks when you have enough canopy and you can go through the grove, get the foliar done. Uh, yeah. It again depends on the economics, but the, those are the things that you can at least be thinking of. Yeah. And and I think, you know, right now we're really we're, we're really learning as we go. And these aren't solid recommendations. We're not recommending chemigation. We're just talking about what we've experienced. So growers, you know, if they want to experiment on their own, they can try this. Yeah. But uh, you know, we'll we'll know a lot more as we as we see more of these oper these these uh, type of applications go out with your work and grower experience. You know, we do hope that growers tell us what they experience when they try some of these things. But um, there's just a lot of we're having to make a lot of adjustments, and so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, just let us know, growers, you know, if you try these things, what your experience is, because we're, right. we're all learning right now with this. And of course, with, with these damaged trees, the responses can be quite variable. They can. It really just depends what kind of loss you endured. Um, yeah. so. Okay, so um, I guess one of the things uh, we we talked about earlier is, uh, you know, as the trees are uh, flushing, you know, putting on new canopy growth, we, we see, uh, you know, a decrease in activity in the roots. They kind of go back and forth. Um, any any recommendations? I mean, does, does that affect how you apply gibberellic acid or does that, does that matter at all? Uh, so what generally happens in the tree is that uh, in the fall, the canopy growth slows down and that's the time for the roots to flush. Unfortunately, now because our canopies have been damaged, the tree is going to push more vegetative growth, especially if the weather stays warm, which means that the roots are going to take a back seat and mm -hmm. roots may not grow as much uh, as we would have wanted, which is, it's a difficult situation. But then the point is leaf versus root. What do you want? You want both. Uh, the tree chooses leaves first, um, whatever the environmental situation is. So... The recommendations going forward would be that, again, pay attention to your fertilizer program, especially in the spring. It's more important than ever getting your fertilizer right in the spring so you are not overstressing those those stress roots which are supporting this growth happening now mm -hmm. in spring. You just promote, have a good fertilization program so okay. those roots are not further stressed. And what about the effects on flowering? Um, we think about gibberellic acid. We've talked in the past about using gibberellic acid to help suppress flowering. But um, I guess really kind of where I was trying to go with that last question, I kind of botched that a little bit. Um, you know, I'm thinking about we've, we've put a lot of effort into carbohydrate allocation into the canopy or root growth. But what, what does this all this mean for next year's flowers, the flower buds? Um, and, you know, can gibberellic acid actually have a negative Im impact if we're already going to have a lower flower set, you know, maybe talk about that. Yes. Um, so uh, the one of the reasons why I was promoting so far gibberellic acid and I still promote gibberellic acid is because it reduces the number of flower to a, a manageable number for the tree. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the biggest benefits of gibberellic acid that you just manage the crop from the beginning. So you, the tree doesn't have to deal with a big crop and then it loses it eventually. So that was the benefit. Now, um, the 
trees which have gone through a significant damage and again i'm talking about trees 70 percent or more uh, leaf loss they have already lost the leaves mm -hmm. roots will push the leaves so you also have kind of lost the roots and if you apply gibberellic acid to suppress flowering it's not a good idea because your carbohydrate resources that are needed for the flower are flowering are already depleted so the tree will do whatever it can to promote flower and now if you go ahead and put another GA spray to suppress flowering you may suppress it too much right. to get a good crop next year and um um, although so how, how late would you say when should you cut off the gibberellic acid sprays if you if you had a grove that's been sustained a considerable amount of damage from the storm it's stressed and we're going through these these rehabilitation programs or re, re, you know rebuilding of the trees how late in the year do you feel comfortable applying gibberellic acid given where we are with a hurricane so um Flower bud induction period usually, um, I mean, it, it really depends on the weather and situation where okay. you are, location. But very in very rough terms, I can say usually from Thanksgiving to Christmas is the peak flower bud induction period. Okay. So a gibberellic acid application during that time period is going to affect the flowering for okay. the next season. So my suggestion is to avoid GA application beyond Thanksgiving, possibly. Now, I've been saying put GA to promote vegetative well, for health, But for healthy groves, absolutely. But if you, <laughs> you've got a grove that sustains significant damage following the hurricane or during the hurricane, you know, our recommendations, what we've talked about, aren't going to hold true. So now we're, we have to think about, okay, we probably need to stop the gibberellic acid applications by, by Thanksgiving okay. so we don't negatively affect bloom in the spring on these trees that are going to have a hard time setting bloom to start with. Yes. Exactly. Absolutely. Okay. I, I can I can follow that. So so very good. So we've talked about cutting off gibberellic acid sprays by in these hurricane damage groves, uh, you know, say around the Thanksgiving time. We we talked a little bit about if you know if the if the groves are sustained a lot of leaf loss, you need to wait a while to put out gibberellic acid. But if the groves are in moderately good shape, um, there is some benefit to doing gibberellic acid sprays right now in terms of helping to keep on our early season crop, keep some of those tree, those fruit from that are stressed from turning yellow or, or dropping. Can you explain, explain that a little bit more? Yes, so gibberellic acid can help the fruit, we know. Um, so if your grove ha is in moderate condition and you still have good amount of fruit left on the tree, uh, getting a GA application would be good. What I do know is that the trees, even in central Florida where the winds wind speed was still significant mm -hmm. so the it's very likely that the fruit may start to change their color a little bit sooner than expected we are in october so hamlets are expected to change color but this much of stress is going to accelerate the color change process okay so we really want to use the gibberellic acid to slow that down before okay. our processing plants are open you want the fruit to hang on the tree uh, so gibberellic acid application can benefit right now um, and it is really important to understand that it is dependent on the color. If you are already seeing a significant color change happening, then possibly uh, cut your losses and not worry. So yeah. as I've been saying, it's really situation dependent. You need to assess your grove. You just cannot have a blanket uh, application. Yeah, so if you're already seeing on our early season, those hamlins are starting to drop. They've changed color earlier than normal. You know, jib acid's not going to do anything to help with those. No, so, okay. so don't don't apply then. But, but if if they've not changed color, then now's the time to do it as to, soon as possible. And it just kind of keeps that that peel integrity, you know, intact. Keeps the maintains the integrity, so they'll stay on the tree a little bit and longer. And it will be a good idea to get it on the mids and the late season okay. varieties because they can definitely benefit at this okay. jib application. Um, Okay. And um, uh, and you did mention the flower bud advisory. You're going to be starting that up at November? November 15th is when I expect the first advisory to go out. And uh, now this year onwards, what I will be doing is that I will have a little bit of a description or details on for people who are applying gibberellic acid. So how should they read this advisory? in respect to the gibberellic acid application. Okay. So that just will help you in guiding a little bit better what you should be doing. Okay. And um, so yeah, definitely look for that information that comes out with the flower bud advisory. 
um, you know, as we get through the fall and we start to think about the spring, you mentioned about how important it is in the spring. What we do in the spring really sets the stage for next year's crop. So what, what, what do growers need to be thinking about application wise in the spring? So uh, fertilization, we have talked that they should get their fertilizer out as soon as it starts getting warm um, to take any stress off of the roots. Uh, also, uh, there are some plant growth regulators, um, some blends of augs and cytokinin and gibberellins that are in the market labeled for citrus use in spring. These are very, um, compared to progip that I have used all my, in all my studies, these uh, other PGRs are relatively dilute uh, PGRs, but they might be sufficient to give uh, that little bit of boost for the trees to grow. Um, okay. I don't want anybody to over apply them for this. Again, I'll repeat why I want, don't want people to use ProJib in the spring is that we don't want to set more fruits than the tree can handle because those fruit will eventually end up on the orchard floor. So. When I'm saying use these other PGRs, I'm talking about just a mild dose. Do not over apply in order to get more vegetative growth because it also has an effect on the fruit. Okay. So there is a balance that growers have to do. We want more fruit, but you don't want to overstress a tree that is just recovering from hurricane. Okay. And so we'll be talking about more, more about that and months to come on yes. recommendations on what you can do in the spring. And, and lastly, I know you also have some recommendations uh, about potassium nitrate and the benefits for these trees in recovery. Yes, so potassium nitrate um, in foliar form is what I'm suggesting to our growers to apply, especially for the mid and the late varieties. Okay. Potassium can help with the fruit growth and uh, it has been known for more than decades. I mean, very long, long time. Uh, it's also in the book, we know potassium helps with the fruit growth. So that can benefit our Valencia fruit usually continues to grow until Christmas mm -hmm. time. So if you can get, get some applications and also then the nitrate will help with the vegetative growth. Nitrate is also important and especially um, there's some literature from um, non-citrus literature that nitrates can help in the flooded situations. So if somebody has endured flooding, um, then probably um, considering potassium nitrate sprays for their late varieties might be something to look into. So what are the what are the timing of these applications? Um, now. Now? Okay. Yeah. For both early and late, or? Early, I'm not sure if we'll get much benefit of the okay. potassium okay. part because the fruit has already stopped growing. The fruit is ready to be harvested pretty soon. So unfortunately for early, potassium doesn't have much benefit at this point, but mid okay. and the late can benefit. Okay, understood. All right. Well, anything else growers need to be thinking about in terms of recovery and taking the stress off these trees? Um, I mean, we have discussed all. Uh, please feel free to contact me because like we have been saying, every situation is unique. I'll be happy to talk to you and walk, uh, talk this out, what is the best thing to do. But um, as with most of the thing, with horticultural practices, it is better to get things done sooner than later in this yeah. situation. We have no time to waste. Okay, well understood. And, and it's definitely, it's a, it's a lot to, th to think about and consider. Um, the hurricanes really changed how you know, everything we've talked about doing, uh, whether it's gibberellic acid or fertilizers and stuff in the past, you know, this changes everything. You have to re reconsider how you make these applications. And it's not, you know, you can't necessarily follow what your neighbor or maybe your grove in another county needs. It's all going to be site specific based on how you weathered the storm. And so, yeah, it definitely complicates things, but we're, we're here to help answer questions and work with you. Uh, you know, Dr. Vashish, the other people we've had on from IFAS, uh, you know, just reach out to us with your questions anytime we can help. Uh, come see us at meetings around the state. And uh, we're here to, to provide what information we have so you can make informed decisions going forward. So thank you, Dr. Bashish, for thank your time. You. All right. Thank you.